right. Uh, let me just wait for a few people to join in and then uh, start. I can already see the attendees uh, numbers going up. Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta Vandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And the topic for today's webinar is bioeconomy, connecting crops, carbon, and cash. We have Jonathan Cocker, uh, who specializes in emerging international and domestic markets, driven by voluntary and compliance environmental mandates, uh, circular economy, renewable natural gas, advanced recycling products, hydrogen and ammonia. And currently, he's associated with uh, BLG Law. Jonathan is moderating today's webinar. He has moderated another webinar on B-Waste Wise in the past, which you will find in the video panel section of our website. Jonathan is going to talk to Brent, who is the Director of Business Development at Scoven Engineering, Brittany Drake, Director at Wood, and Jason Jaworski, who is the President and CEO at Matter Global Solutions. Uh, just a reminder to all the attendees that we will take your questions. Please use the Q&A section to drop your questions in. Use the chat box if you have other comments. And uh, we, we have a full house today, so I'm, pretty I'm looking forward to an interesting one hour. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. And, and, and thanks to uh, Be Waste Wise for uh, hosting this session. I know it's one that we've had a lot of interest in. Uh, in North America and elsewhere, and that that is obviously the bioeconomy and, and understanding the interaction between uh, markets, uh, environmental attributes, environmental uh, outcomes, and and monetizing opportunities, and that includes uh, on farm and off farm related biogas. And we'll talk about those uh, as we go. But first, I want to give each of our three August panelists an opportunity to, uh, to uh, tell us more about what they do and what their businesses do. And that I think leads me first to Brittany. Uh, Brittany, please tell us more about uh, what Wood's up to in this bioeconomy space, including in the biogas space. Hi, Jonathan, thank you. Um, so as Swetha says, I'm Brittany Drake and I'm the business development director for Wood's Energy Assets and Technologies. For those of you not familiar with Wood, we're a global leader in consulting and engineering across energy and the built environment, helping to unlock solutions to some of the world's most critical challenges. Um, we provide consulting projects and operation solutions in more than 60 countries, supporting our clients throughout the full life cycle of their projects. Achieving a uh, sustainable future is the most pressing issue facing our generation. And at Wood, we're committed to a low carbon future. We support the current scientific understanding of climate change, the effects of carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions and their effects on the environment. We recognize the role we play in driving a low carbon economy. And we're actively helping clients navigate towards a sustainable energy future through optimizing operations, uh, low carbon production systems, and even pioneering renewable projects. Because we do so much in so many sectors, it's always a challenge to sum it up in one sentence. Uh, simpler to think if it relates to making or running your asset, whatever you think of as an asset, then we can probably support it. Whoever you are, wherever you work, we can help. Now, the challenge the world faces is meeting growing energy needs in a way that is compatible with reducing emissions and the impact of climate change, which is, which is going to require clean and carbon-free energy sources. Um, many utilities are looking for sources of green natural gas to add to their portfolios to support their decarbonization and energy transition objectives. Over the years, industry and scientific research have gained interest in developing new methods of natural gas production by exploiting alternative and more abundant resources without losing the possibility to achieve end user demand and needs. Uh, synthetic natural gas or SNG is natural gas that can be produced from coal or renewable biomass gasification and also biogas upgrading. 
So bio SNG or biomethane is one of the most flexible approaches to decarbonize end demand, including residential heating, transportation, cogeneration. Um, it's also a practical pathway for final users. Um, it's easy connection of the production plants to the existing natural gas networks. The infrastructure is already in place and the technologies are available and mature for commercial application. In areas where there are periodic local excess renewable power generation, which cannot be economically stored with batteries, utility and energy companies are looking for gas to power technologies to deploy even the generation of hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen generation through electrolysis can be further converted to green carbon neutral methane through the methanation process. Green methane has some advantages over hydrogen in some applications as it's more easily stored and distributed than hydrogen. Wood owns a methanation technology called Vesta that can be used to convert syngas from various sources of um, so convert syngas from any gasified source, um, either biomass or, or waste. And it can also be implemented to, or in a power to gas scheme uh, to generate green synthetic natural gas. The technology is a simple and efficient process to convert the syngas to bio SNG or biomethane. Um, as I said, it's a simple process. It's a once through operation, which is unique to the other technologies that are out there on the market. There's no need for an expensive recycled compressor or refractory reactors, um, reducing the capital expenditure by 20% or more. Um, Wood built a pilot plant in China, which was successfully tested in 2016. And this was on coal gasification uh, shortly after that. Shortly after that, we secured a UK government funding to build a plant in Swindon. Um, unfortunately, that company went bankrupt and it wasn't until recently in 2019 that somebody came in and purchased the asset, secured the UK funding, and now we're in the process of commissioning that, that site. And this is on the biofuels, um, uh, biofuels, uh, to produce the biomethane. Um, it's, uh, let me see, the, I did want to talk about how, well, we've completed many projects over the, over the years uh, doing many feasibility studies. We're really excited about this plant in, Lin in Swindon so we can have, um, we can prove the, the biomass gasification process. Um, let's see, do we have any questions so far on anything that I've? Uh, Brittany, let, let, let me just uh, jump in and, and, and ask you uh, for, for Woods, Woods' views around what essentially you described in sort of crossing the floor. In other words, Wood as a, an engineering firm, a services firm, uh, you know, with a, a, a great deal of sophisticated offerings, but nonetheless on the service side, moving over and owning proprietary technology. Can you describe sort of the, the strategy, the thinking around making that leap into the market as opposed to being a provider to the market? Yeah, so the proprietary process technologies um, come from legacy acquisitions from Foster Wheeler. Foster Wheeler has been a technology licensor for several years. We own um, process technologies in heavy oil gas applications. So for delayed coking, solvent deasphalting, um, sulfur recovery, and hydrogen production. We also um, own technology fired heaters as well that support the technology process. So we do offer performance guarantees as part, of, as part of our licensed technologies. The hydrogen production technology is a really exciting technology that we've developed and or that we've optimized over the years 
to, you know, with the new decarbonization efforts and race to net zero, transitioning our gray hydrogen, which is very carbon intensive, to now produce blue hydrogen. We've optimized, um, or our method of hydrogen production is steam methane reforming. And as I said, it's very carbon intensive. And so once you tack on carbon capture to a gray hydrogen unit, you can now be producing blue hydrogen. We've further optimized the process to reduce those emissions even further with pre-combustion carbon capture. Um, this background and knowledge with methane is what introduced us to developing this VESTA technology back in, back in uh, 2012, I think is when we began looking at, looking at this process. Um, it's just been more recently that it's starting to develop further into the agro industry. Um, Back in 2016, you know, it was really focused on a new solution to produce natural gas for some of those countries that aren't, uh, that don't have easy, cheap access to natural gas like we do here in the, in the States. Um, optimizing that or further enhancing that, that technology to take any source of syngas so biomass and biogas upgrading has been a, I guess, fairly newer process that we've been testing and proving over the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, and, and as you say, dr driven really by the, the um, momentum we've seen in this sort of energy transition space, right, over the past, I'm tempted to say it's now, we're now year four, give or take, so something like 2018, Obviously, a great deal of things were happening prior to that time, but I think we've seen a real acceleration, a real focus in the space um, in ways that uh, we're all sort of still grappling with. Um, and obviously, Woods, Woods in a, a, a leadership position, having made this investment and promoted this technology in advance of, of the sort of wave that we're, we're now seeing in, yeah. in every right? Renewable natural gas, hydrogen, uh, mm -hmm. uh, synthetic natural gas, uh, ammonia energy. Uh, methanol. Um, so it's a, an exciting time. Let me um, let me just pass over to, to Jason Zwerski for a minute. Jason, we're, when we when we talk about uh, renewable natural gas and we look at uh, you know the the pathways, can you can you talk about what what Matter is doing and uh, where it sees its opportunities on a go forward basis, uh, whether it's in Canada or elsewhere? Yeah, no, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for. Uh for moderating and so thanks for uh, putting this uh, great call together. Um, so yeah, Matter uh, matter focuses on both project development and technology development. Uh, we've got some proprietary technologies we're, we're growing uh, in the gasification space. Um, we see a great synergy with uh, anaerobic digestion and gasification kind of as a, a long-term approach to things like waste management solution on a municipal scale, um, commercial opportunities where I've been at this for quite a while and uh, I haven't really seen one technology that I would say does everything. So I think it makes sense when you, um, when you take a look at uh, you know, large portfolio of technologies out there, um, finding you know, a unique market opportunity and a unique feedstock and then applying those technologies. So our, uh, our recent work has been uh, probably more in the anaerobic digester space. Um, kind of funny, I come from a waste management background. So, you know, we saw opportunities here in Canada uh, with the opening markets around renewable natural gas. And, and, and our first, you know, position was, yeah, it's definitely going to be a waste play, right? There, there's so many opportunities there. And um, I still believe that there's a lot of, uh, you know, unique opportunities, both from a, a carbon reduction, uh, a landfill, space reduction or, or utilizing of, of those resources in a better way. Um, but, uh, you know, we ended up getting ourselves into a, an agricultural project that I'm, I'm really excited about in, uh, in northern BC. Um, and, you know, we're, uh, I guess we've learned a fair bit about, you know, what it takes to do an on-farm uh, agricultural 
uh, feedstock supply to RNG. So that's taking up a lot of our time. Um, you know, and I would say I see a lot of opportunities there because if you look at, you know, Alberta uh, and, and BC, those markets, um, there's a there's a really uh, a, a nice opportunity to look at location and, and, and the location that we've selected is sitting in around, you know, 20,000 acres of farmland uh, near a place called Clayhurst. So we wanted to go uh, and position this project uh, where we were close to the feedstock and probably more importantly, close to uh, the digestate. So anaerobic digestion, I think one of the challenges um, that I've seen and, and, and others have probably as well is it's, it's fairly complex. You have to securitize feedstock and you also have to, you know, obviously have an energy transition. Um, that's typically, uh, you know, in our case, been renewable natural gas, but but also the, the fertilizer application. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've done a lot of work uh, with, a, you know, and, and we're going out and building these networks of, of farming um, of large scale farmers. So they can also take advantage of uh, their regenerative farming strategies. Uh, how do we apply the digestate? And I think the way for it to be successful is, you know, finding that right location, finding the right uh, network of uh, agricultural players that want to participate, you know, in a low carbon uh, strategy, one that they can apply digestate. And also uh, one a very interesting thing that we found was with an anaerobic digester in a farming community, it gives the, the farmers uh, alternatives. So if they wanted to participate in crop rotations, there are many crops that are adding significant biological um, carbon value back to the land, but there's just no market for it. So uh, one example would be uh, uh, sweet clover, uh, which adds nitrogen back into, into the land. It's an it's a extra crop that they can grow in the spring season, and it works great in a digester, but there's no other market for it. You can't really sell this product, either a silage or, or other type of feed or, or any other agricultural use. So, you know, as, as we're working through this, I think our biggest, um, you know, the, the biggest excitement would be really finding a, a network of, uh, of agricultural uh, participants. And, and that's really helped us grow because now we're learning what do they need? What are the applications that they're looking for that we can then modify you know, our technology or our design of plants um, so that we're flexible. We could take in various feedstocks. We can um, put in different products. It's gonna maybe give a better carbon nitrogen ratio and digest it and make the application very useful and applicable. And, and that's, I think that's what we're really excited about is the agriculture or on farm based, you know, large scale anaerobic digesters that can um, help transition the agricultural community into more sustainable farming. Um, you know, fairly new to the agri agricultural space, but learning um, how how poor uh, how poor the land actually is. Right, um, many of these generational farms are 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 are, are, are ex extremely uh, extremely concerned about you know the quality of their land. So uh, uh, I think that there's a huge opportunity in, in you know anaerobic digestion. I think there's some products that, uh, feedstock products, uh, straws and things like that, uh, that'll work well in gasification. Gasification technology, specifically the one that we're uh, working with, can produce biochar that has many applications back into, uh, into the farmland. So, you know, I, I think we went at this, um, <clears throat> looking primarily at the, at the energy side of it. Uh, and now that I'm, I'm pretty confident that there's huge growth opportunity and that's probably your side of building that model. Um, but the work has come in on uh, feedstock uh, contracts and, 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 and working with the farming community so that we know that when we go to the, you know, the finance market, we have uh, the right conditions, the right terms. And it actually makes sense for the farming community. We're not just looking to um, use manure or, or, or silage products. Uh, we're actually looking to interface with the agricultural uh, world and, 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 and 
it's much better for a long-term strategy. So uh, I'm pretty excited how that's going on. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Jason, you, you know, you've, you've talked about a, a number of sort of sustainable agriculture um, facets of, the, of this project. And, and when we look back at anaerobic digestion and, and on-farm projects, I think, I think we're kind of seeing a 2.0, are we not, in this space? So, I mean, agri AD and, and, and farming were sort of tied together when the, perhaps the horizons were smaller, right? That, that, that you know, this, this was production to deal with uh, uh, waste management on farm and it was to deal with localized uh, supply of energy. But it seems like we're now looking at this through a very different lens. We're looking at it through an energy transition lens and we're looking at it in respect of regenerative farming in, in a way that, and monetizing the activities that previously everyone, there was a great deal of talk about the importance of these activities, but there wasn't a monetary driver for these activities. And I think that's one of the things that you've been describing in terms of the Clayhurst project is that there's now a driver to make these, to make these projects work in ways uh, that they didn't previously. I mean, is, is, that, is, that, is that a fair assessment? <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. Um, we did see back probably, you know, let's say 12, 15 years ago um, throughout Canada, uh, the development of anaerobic digesters, primarily exactly what you said. Let's, you know, if it's a small dairy farm, they were smaller, they were typically producing electrical power under some FIT program here yeah. uh, in Ontario, Canada, right? So, you know, I, I think that's where uh, anaerobic digestion started to to open up, uh, you know, in North America, specifically Canada, um, based on what we've seen in Europe. Obviously, there's 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 ten thousand plus, I think, just in Germany alone. So it's a very mature market. Um, but now, um, you know, with renewable natural gas opening up, I, I think I think that's really you know is is where the impact you know uh, or the driver uh, is coming from. Uh, but I like how you said 2.0 because it's it's no longer um, because of the demand for RNG. I don't think it's it's small scale thinking. Uh, I think it's partnerships with farmers that give them other you know other revenue models. It gives them a real solution to regenerative farming, but it's on scale. You know, I, I know our, our farming yeah. network in the players area it was probably going to tap into close to 40, 50,000 tons. Uh, sorry, 50,000 acres to get the tonnage we need. And, and they also want to benefit by, you know, rotating their crops and being integrated into that, into that plan. So that's bigger thinking than small scale digesters that we've seen in Canada before. And again, with the push for real regenerative farming, I mean real because um, I, I think there actually is a problem. And I think the farming community is really concerned. This isn't, um, uh, anything that I, I think is going to be a bubble. I think this is a real, you know, a change in thinking, a change in practice. So um, it's scale and it's opportunities for sustainable regenerative farming plus supply of, uh, of massive, massive scale of, uh, of, of RNG. Uh, you know, in, in, in British Columbia, just look what, you know, Fortis is doing. And, you know, I think they're now uh, focusing on 15% of their total distribution of gas to come from RNG, uh, I think by 2030, right? So those are serious numbers and, and, and it's gonna take significant projects, uh, you know, to drive, uh, to drive those su success factors forward. So I definitely think we're, we're 2.0. I definitely think there's um, uh, some, um, you know, opportunities in hydrogen that's coming along. And I think, um, you know, it's exciting times to see how market needs, project development, and, and technology uh, are, are going to kind of come together to, you know, to drive these, these bigger long-term projects. Great, great. Well, let me, uh, let me pass it over to you, Brent. I mean, we're, um, you know, we've been talking about uh, RNG, but biomethane, uh, and we're talking about purchase programs, including by uh, a, a, you know, a natural gas uh, distributor in the province of British Columbia, Canada. Um, and we've seen uh, similar initiatives elsewhere in Canada and elsewhere in the world. Um, can you talk, Brent, a bit about uh, about this idea that uh, the agriculture community uh, and biogas have have had sort of a re, you know a resurgence in terms of a partnership, in terms of a regenerative 
uh, agricultural model and, and how Scovan is, is participating in this? Okay. okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, as far as, you know, farming and oil and gas, they haven't always been friends. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were multiple examples where you had, you know, these oil men come by and say, can we put a well on your land and everything? And it pulls out millions of dollars of profit. And the farmer didn't see anything of this. The next thing you know, we've got dead wells all over these farmers' lands. Um, same time, too, these can be relatively, well, let's see here, I, I'm going to have to be careful here, but both the oil men and the farmers, they can be hotbeds of even climate change denial. And so, <laughs> far, yeah. And so as far as this whole idea where it's like, oh, you know, we need to, res you know, there's a resurgence in the partnership, they sometimes weren't too friendly. Um, and so what we're finding now is um, it's not just simply the economics that are supporting this shift. Um, it's actually just even awareness too. And maybe just some sort of you know, healing of some of these divides as well. But as far as just the way in which these farmers and um, I guess, you know, women can now work together. Um, I sometimes feel I'm kind of at the epicenter of it. Well, not, not me personally, you got Vancouver in the background there. <laughs> my entire, yeah, but my entire team is in Calgary, um, and we're, we're and that's like just oil and gas center, right? Um, it made lots of money over years and everything, but then over time, suddenly these utilities, just due to investor pressure, uh, some public pressure, maybe also just utilities right across Canada, started saying, "Well, we need to actually decarbonize. So we're going to commit to this. We actually have ESG plans and what have you." Um, this almost came as a surprise <laughs> to a lot of people. Um, conveniently, uh, the technology, I mean, there's, there are some newer technologies out there. I love the fact there's always advancements coming around, but to describe any of this tech, well, not describe the base of the technology as unproven would be ludicrous. This stuff has been around for a half century. Uh, anaerobic digestion has been around for more than a hundred years. Um, this is stuff that is deeply proven. Um, conveniently, too, these utilities um, also have enough money to be able to pay for much of this transition as well. So we actually found ourselves in this awkward position where we were being, you know, actively pressed, aggressively pushed by billions of dollars, about a billion and a half directly from our clients, all our oil and gas clients saying, please help us um, to decarbonize. So then it just came down to actually, you know, supporting the industry. So maybe that loops back to what our strategy has been. Um, our strategy, we, we haven't really been able to even bid on many projects. There hasn't been that much going out there. There's a couple on the public side, but realistically, these large industrial ones are all stuff that need to actually be fermented and, if anything, incubated from within. So um, I'm, I'm a chemical engineer as far as my academic background, uh, but I've found myself doing all sorts of absurd stuff just to help the industry where there's the money behind it, there's the proven technology behind it, but just the pieces and machinery is just not there. Uh, so I'm, I find myself talking, I've, I've talked with uh, three um, cover cropping and intercropping professors last week. Um, I've been chatting with numerous farmers um, uh, every once in a while, I end up chatting with a lawyer as well, too, John. Um, there's <laughs> and, uh, and then there's going to be, and then there's also, you know, numerous utilities as well, too. I'm doing precisely zero chemical engineering work. I'm just simply herding cats at this point in time, bringing things together. And that has been, if any, although we do have, you know, anaerobic digestion and it exists out there, um, it, it would only, just given the, where we need to get. Given the scale of the opportunity, um, given that we're talking about increasing something 20-fold, it would almost be awkward calling it resurgence. I mean, for parts of Alberta, it's almost hitting them for the first time. Yeah. So, um, so and, and now, again, the, I, there's, uh, you know, there, there is, you know, different types of pushback, and we can talk about that if we want to and everything. But it's been really fascinating just how... Um, quickly things have been able to move, um, how optimistic things are with this com almost, you know, complete greenfield uh, opportunity. Um, it's, and again, especially in Alberta, and that's where we have all our biomass as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I, 
recognize that my story is probably a bit more localized than the Woods story. I'm intimidated by Brittany's numbers. It's very impressive there. Um, <laughs> she's two, you're a hundred times bigger than me. My goodness. But, um, but our, our, our story is, is very personal as far as it being Western Canada and having this massive whipsaw effect going from oil and gas Calgary with Prime Minister Stephen Harper. And uh, we're not sure which side of the you know, climate change discussion we're on to suddenly we have, um, <laughs> we have, uh, we have a, a, a MP Gilbo uh, as our environment minister. We have a, a climate positive uh, prime minister. We have utilities that are throwing all the money in the world basically at decarbonization. Uh, there still are some hiccups, but the change has been drastic, absolutely drastic. Yeah. Um, and it's just needed uh, a great deal of holistic support to be able to make this stuff happen rather than, I don't know, I, I worked in the mining sector for a while and you'd go to a CIM conference and there would be 20 different providers for every single type of service you could ever want. And everyone had already dealt with each other a hundred times. So projects could actually just simply you know, be, 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 go together uh, without any real challenge. Here, some people were completely unaware of this and, and, and even, even unaware of, them, of the credits, the uh, ways they could get credits from, from, not just simply from biogas, but everywhere along the whole supply chain, as yeah. far as ways in which they could earn, the, earn these benefits. There was, it was not just money, it was a full on lack of awareness. So yeah. I don't know, I, I, I feel like I'm this, you know, more, more of an educator and sort of, you know, bring, bring things together rather than using my iron ring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, and I think, Brent, you're absolutely right. I mean, in this, in this space, the demand seems to be out front of the supply, uh, which, is, which is, you know, remarkable. Um, and, 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 and when we look at, uh, you know, for those of us who sort of come at this from the resource recovery space, the waste space, you know, we, we look at it and say, how, how do we participate? How, how do we enter into these markets? How do we, you know, how do we add value and assist companies in this decarbonization push? And of course, you know, we've seen, as we talked about in terms of uh, biogas, you know, we've seen that sort of that first uh, first growth of these projects driven by uh, electricity, preferred electricity rates, feed in tariffs uh, of various stripes across the country. And then, and then now we're kind of looking at it again and saying, because of these purchase programs, because of these these other drivers, and, and crediting is something that uh, is 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 uh, still kind of working itself out, both in I think in you know in various parts of the world, including in Europe. But but the crediting drivers, yeah. as as well as the as the gas itself, you know these kind of things really create new opportunities to kind of integrate and be and be relevant in this decarbonization push for the oil and gas sector. Yeah, right, yeah. so it allows us to become relevant again in ways where we were sort of, uh, you know, the waste space was sort of a, a an afterthought, perhaps, in terms of the the energy transition previously. And I think we're starting to see that change again. We're starting to yeah. see emissions from waste being relevant, as well as the as the products from waste. And we had a question uh, uh, earlier in this call uh, around what kind of feedstocks can give rise to. Uh, a biogas or a synthetic natural gas, depending upon um, uh, how you come at it. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about the sort of thing we're seeing in terms of, you know, feedstocks and maybe more generally around this sort of bioeconomy uh, push and, and where those resources come from and what sort of things we see uh, being produced, being uh, monetized in terms of the products and the processes and the energies. Oh, okay. Um See that I, I, that's one thing I kind of find, I find kind of fascinating about biogas, biofuels. Um, it's not your typical resource program project. It's not like all right, fine, I've got a whole bunch of iron ore. I need to take iron out of that. I'm going to sell my iron. Congrats, right? Um, it's a mixture of feedstocks that are available to this uh, to the to this um, to this industry, and then. Once you're partly done producing the gas or the fuel, there's things you can do with it afterwards. Actually, even getting the feedstock as well, too. There's times where there's intercropping, cover cropping, all sorts of things that can be done in advance. Of that. So there's revenue all along the supply chain. As far as the types of feedstocks that are available, um, 
it's anything that isn't finally at its absolute base value as far as uh, as far as potential energy. Uh, I mean, it's it's anything from you know bacon fat to banana peels. Uh, it's uh, now there's going to be different technology out there. Um, there's times where you have this unbelievably energy dense thing called fog, you know, fat soils and greases and everything. And that can be mar marvelously tur tur turn into a biodiesel relatively easily too. Again, very, very easy technology there. Um, but then you say, okay, well, all right, let's talk about stuff that Jay and I are doing. We're talking about manure, or we're talking about, um, I guess, you know, waste, uh, waste, uh, uh, waste from agriculture or, or silage and everything. That has all sorts of good energy to it. Not quite as dense, so you need a slightly larger project. Um, then you have some things that are marvelously energy dense, but kind of take fancier technology to deal with it. Let's say like, you know, wood chips. Um, they don't really rot too quickly. So you kind of need to do stuff where you need to take on syngas technologies. And I think Brittany could speak to that as well too. Just because you're talking about some things that need just a little bit more aggression, <laughs> maybe, maybe if any, as, as far as actually being able to get the energy out of it, but then you produce syngas. So um, I, the long short of it is, and of course, and I, again, I haven't even mentioned landfills, but of course that stuff that just bubbles off those landfills and essentially yes. it's, it's for free. Um, but you have all these situations where we've wasted feedstocks. We've wasted the energy that uh, was in this. We're, we're, we're throwing out the banana peels. We're throwing out um, the bacon fat. We're, we're throwing out the wood chips. Um, and that was one of the first projects that I was, I was working on there where again, Williams Lake, it was, it was garbage. It was a whole bunch of stuff coming from sawmills and it was just being burned in beehive burners with black smoke going in the sky all around Williams Lake. Um, that was recognized as an opportunity that was just wasted energy. So, and, and then that, that also maybe even speaks to a, a proper, uh, I guess, a strategy behind this. You don't necessarily want to be just, you know, sitting on your hands, waiting for an RFP, or so saying, okay, well, when's someone going to finally come to me and ask for an energy project? It's, it's almost a little bit easier to say, okay, well, where's someone wasting this stuff? Like, where is this stuff being actively wasted and I can help this company? Yeah. Um, you know, not only bring in some revenue, but help the planet. My goodness, it just, it, it, it's it, even just the whole sense as an engineer, just saying, seeing something of tremendous energy value um, being tossed into a landfill, that should be heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. And so that's sort of what, what, we're, what we're doing there. So, I mean, as far as the, the range of feedstocks, um, yeah, the, if you've got asbestos and gyp rock, I'm afraid, no, we can't do too much with that. That's already reached its, its bottom environmental value there. Yeah. But if it has any sort of cellulose to it, oh, we'd be tickled pink to use it. Yeah, and, and Brian, you know, you make a, a great comment around how this industry is, is developing. It's, you know, for, for a lot of us, uh, the plan is not to sit on our hands, as you say, and, and wait for uh, a public tendering process to occur because uh, that that tends to be a small subset of the opportunities and it certainly isn't uh, something that is all, all, always timely and always kind of at the front edge of this market. Instead, what we're seeing, I, I think, is, is we're seeing opportunities being identified by those in the space and right, we are actively looking at what's going on out there, seeing these resources not being uh, fully utilized uh, in a way that makes sense and going after them and saying, look, this is something we can do something with. And, and as drivers, as we talked about, we've got the energy, but we've also got the crediting. And, and the crediting, I think I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna suggest, the crediting comes from the resource, re, the resource recovery at the front end, the emissions and, and energy in the middle, and then the, re, you know, the uh, nutrients and regenerative activities at the back end. So I think we've got three different spokes in terms of how you understand these things. So, if you're selling into a, a purchase uh, program, uh, we talked about Ford as BC, um, th they tend to get the middle of the three, right? They get the emissions around the energy, but that's not to say there aren't other crediting opportunities at the front and back end that also will be meaningful in terms of the overall financial um, uh, participation, the financial opportunity uh, going forward. So yeah, I think this is a very interesting uh, analysis around how these projects can get built and fund it in ways that they previously perhaps couldn't. You needed to you needed to only be on the tariff, and if you didn't get the tariff, uh, your horizons, as we said, were were very short. Now, now let me go back to you, Brittany. What are we seeing in terms of 
uh, Wood's involvement around feedstock. So what sort of things is, is Wood looking at? Uh, but I think you, you've talked about the UK project and what, you know, maybe you talked a bit about the feedstocks there and perhaps what, what Wood is looking at elsewhere in terms of that production of a syngas. Yeah, so um, it really doesn't matter the source of the syngas. Um, depending on what the source is, it may have some impurities that need to be cleaned up um, to apply with the Vesta technology to produce the biomethane. Um, we've seen a wide range. Our, our SMEs do have quite a bit experience, of experience in working with many different uh, gas, gasification technologies, but um, wood waste is a big one. Um, then, so this one in the UK, uh, because it was a government funding, it did require a certain amount of biogenetic content. Um, to Brent's point, it really doesn't matter the, the source of to produce that syngas, um, we can yeah. we can certainly produce that biomethane, and we've uh, yeah, as I said, we've worked with various different applications to get the syngas to that to that point. Yeah, that specification. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think um, Jason, if I can just uh, come back to you in terms of your your comments a minute ago uh, around. Uh, regenerative farming. So, you know, we've got we, we've got uh, the agriculture sector needing a you know needing improvement around around uh, soil quality, around uh, you know more sustainable practices. And it it seems, and maybe this is uh, simplistic, but it seems as if a a, a robust uh, biogas industry, on farm biogas industry, does allow for some of these activities that otherwise made uh, insufficient economic sense to be engaged in previously. In other words, things like uh, crop rotations, um, uh, cover crops, potentially uh, no-till farming, um, herd rotations, those, those kind of activities. Can you talk a bit, Jason, about, about those kind of things as you're, as you're engaging the agricultural community, what, what you're hearing and what you're seeing? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'll go back to a comment Brent made uh, earlier around, uh, I guess, traditionally, you, you saw oil wells on farmer on farmer fields. And, you know, where we are located in northern British Columbia, as, as you see throughout Alberta, uh, you know, that has been a, a relationship uh, that's been established uh, for, for decades. Um, so I, I guess we learned this a little bit the hard way, but... Uh, you know, uh, when we went uh, to partner with uh, with our with our, um, uh, our large scale farmer in in, Clay, in Clayhurst area, I think our you know our biggest challenge was how do we get the gas to market. So we took a different approach and looked at existing infrastructure. So we're not actually upgrading our gas on site. We're actually shipping out raw biogas. Just uh, it, it's it's no different than what's being done now in, in adjacent farms where there's raw gas being pulled out of the ground and, and shipped to large, large scale at massive, massive existing facilities to clean that gas up and get it in the pipeline as, as renewable natural gas. So, um, you know, the, the molecules of gas are all the same. It's, it's essentially CH4 is what we're all producing. We're, we're stripping out some CO2 and uh, H2S. So, so that gets done off site. So I guess specifically to your your question is uh, seeing the the existing infrastructure there uh, and we could tap into it. Right. Because, again, at the end of the day, it's very similar to what's been done for for, for many decades. And then that puts us in the heartland. That puts us close to the feedstock supply, and it puts us close to uh, the digestate, you know, application process or or, or, or strategy, I guess, and how they're going to implement this. So it, it makes it very realistic. It reduces our, the cost both on shipping the front end and 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 the back end product, the digestate out, and we can integrate with that community. And, and that has been a challenging, uh, I guess. Uh, you know, experience. Uh, it's been a, it's been a quite a journey, but 
it comes back to, you know, finding the right partner. So you got the energy partner, the offtake, you've got somebody who has infrastructure, obviously who, you know, might be seeing in the future, you know, a reduction in, in, in new wells and things like that. So maybe the, the RNG, uh, you know, industry can help to fill some of those voids that, you know, would typically, you know, uh, might, might have a reduction because as we move away from the fossil fuel market. So, uh, I think it's complex, it's, but it's definitely doable. Uh, and, and we are seeing traction. We're seeing a lot of interest for future projects being driven by all three of those you know, components, infrastructure, end user energy, and, and, and the farming partners. So uh, I, I think you know, we, we do have to get some projects on the ground. We do have to get these relationships moving forward so that then we can have a template and say, here's how regenerative farming can work, say in Canada, uh, here's how we can look at it on scale. Here's how we're gonna, you know, um, you and I have talked before about, you know, the growing carbon market. So, you know, what are the, uh, you know, what are the tools that we can use to produce more credits, uh, i.e. digestate, um, regenerative farming, ro crop rotation, biochar, over and above the, you know, the, the, the credit that gets delivered with the molecule gas. Um, so I, I think it's pretty exciting that you know, there is really uh, an integration strategy here that I think is, is fundamentally uh, you know, sort of set up for high growth. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and let me ask you, uh, you know, to, in traditional resource projects, uh, there, there's an expectation of a, an existing long-term supply of that resource to be extracted and, and monetized, right? And I think Brent, you know, Brent was talking about iron ore earlier and, and maybe that's a good comparator. So, so here, here we have a, uh, an, an active farming community. We have uh, commodity prices that uh, vary potentially uh, you know, from year to year. Uh, we have uh, the needs of the community based on the uh, environmental conditions that fluctuate as we've seen. Um, how, do you, how, do, how do you go to those who uh, would finance these projects and get them comfortable that uh, you will have the, the feedstock for the life of the project uh, without necessarily pointing to it uh, on day one as being fully satisfied? I, I think that was um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we had uh, or that we were faced with was, you know, um, taking, uh, taking this project to the next level and, and getting that, that, uh, you know, the, the funding partners, uh, and, and it's challenging to do a 20 year sort of offtake deal with, with a, um, you know, large scale farmer. Um, it's a very cyclical market. Uh, right now, I think most prices are fairly high. So it's, it's, it's a challenge for us to kind of break into that market. So what we did, uh, you know, and I, I think it was just after, um, you know, opening ourselves up to, to the farmers as partners and, and, you know, saying, you know, we don't want to just compete for product, whether it's silage, uh, and those are the more challenging, you know, areas of this where you want to have a specific type of crop, uh, you're, you're competing with, with, the, with the current market. So what we did is, you know, we went back and said, can, can we grow crops at different times? So in our case, um, you know, can farmers add more revenue by putting in a spring crop that's going to, again, add value back to the land and, and we'd be the sole off taker of that. So that is making sense. Um, there's enough, uh, there's enough um, large scale farmers, uh, you know, that we've had the opportunity to deal with that they can rotate, they can look at it, say a 10 or 20 year plan. So, you know, we, we do have a lead farming uh, partner uh, under a, a 20 year managed agreement. And then we'll look at off taking, uh, you know, sort of a three year term um, so that everybody's protected. We're, we're going to be able to take advantage of some, some good uh, economic opportunities for ourselves and provide additional revenue and regenerative for that, you know, building value back in the land component. Um, another thing that we're seeing too is, you know, there are seasonal issues. So it could be mold, could be drought, could be other things that come up where a farmer have a crop that he's hoping to sell in the market and it doesn't meet spec. Um, so we go to that farmer and say, 
we're more than happy to take that off your hands. We're going to look at the um, uh, conversion of that feedstock into biogas and then, then, then put a price on it. So therefore, mm. you know, again, by having a large scale digester in a big farming network community, it, it really helps us to take advantage of those, those four times or the downtimes on the farmer's side. It gives them the opportunity to say, I'm not losing all that revenue. Here I can now, you know, get some out of my crop. So um, without having that digester, you know, complaint, um, essentially they're, they're, they're plowing it back in or, or removing it from the linen and there's no value. So those things are happening year in, year out. Right? So, so I, I think it's just uh, being aware of that. Yeah, I mean, look, it strikes me as a very, a very flexible circular economy model, right? So it, right, it's, it's Absolutely. those resources that, that uh, can be obtained at the best price that ultimately uh, feed, uh, you know, feed the digester, have that right mass, the right mass balance, make sense in terms of the biogas production, but, but happen to be things that otherwise need to be circulated back, right? That, and, and on day one, you may not be able to see what those are, in year six or year seven, but but simply being flexible enough to to take advantage of those things in the communities in which they're produced, that strikes me as a, a, a very circular, a very much a model that that other parts of the world will look at and say that makes sense for us to having that flexibility, a commitment to circular economy, but a flexibility around what that feedstock mix is year in year out based on the actual performance of the of the agriculture community and the commodity prices that that go along with it. So a, a very interesting model, I think, that'll that'll uh, resonate uh, to our audience uh, internationally. Um, Brent, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about uh, a topic that's perhaps near and dear to your heart, and that is uh, sustainable agribusiness. And, and maybe we start with uh, sustainable beef and what oh. we're seeing around biogas production and it's you know on-farm biogas and and a sort of a marriage if I can call it that uh with the sustainable beef, beef movement I wonder if you can you can talk about that a bit see that, that that's another fun one there because you've got all this you know all these old guys that are you know climate change deniers but then you have these beef producers saying please <laughs> don't don't let it, you know, no one talk about how tough this stuff is on the environment um but then you've got uh, and I guess uh, certain companies, many companies, um, the, the major ones, the biggest ones, both supermarkets and fast food providers that are saying we, our customers want sustainable beef. So it's being, it's being pushed on, uh, being, being pushed towards these farmers. There's numerous ways to do it. Um, the most environmentally sound way is actually, you know, I guess with this, you know, beautiful farm where everything's marvelously circular and it produces this unbelievably delicious and expensive steak at the end of the day. Um, but people still do consume a lot of ground beef. People do, do consume a lot, uh, consume a lot of uh, commodity level beef yeah. and um, decarbonizing that probably provides the most bang for the buck. Um, just as far as being able to improve things. So we actually own uh, a, a 40,000 head feedlot in Southern Alberta. Uh, and we've been looking at that because, again, as much as, you know, there's all these efficiencies they've been able, able to build in and everything over years, there's a lot of the stuff that you know, dates back to the 1980s as far as how they deliver, deliver the stuff. Um, and so the whole idea of like, well, here's the methane footprint of this animal. Here's what's going on there is almost, a, almost a, an irritating shock to some of these farmers. Um, but, the, but one of the indicators, there's actually several pillars to achieving uh, sustainable beef uh, certification. But one of the, the pillars is methane management. Uh, along with animal welfare, there's a whole bunch of other stuff is where it's just not just only about the environment as a whole, it's also about treating the animal well. Um, these are all things that um, in, in, together uh, can get a, get a person, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess, certified for sustainable beef. Um, and, uh, and actually having methane management, being it actually methane managing directly through the animals or actually connect, collecting the manure and managing it there is a key pillar of that. So that actually helps a person get or helps a farmer get um, CRSB uh, certified. Um, unfortunately, the month, it'd be nice if the money was a little bit more attractive. Um, I think the amount that consumers are willing to pay for sustainable beef, and it's also a higher quality product, it is something where there's tons of money behind this, but the supply chain that was built for, for beef was 
created back in the 1970s. And uh, it's, it's kind of broken in a couple ways. So you can actually have a farmer put a whole bunch of effort into making their beef sustainable, but they may get as little as 18 extra dollars per full on, you know, per, per animal, um, maybe up to 60 for meeting all these standards. Um, that should be much more. These farmers deserve much more for their efforts. Um, so they're not seeing it yet. I know there's various different lobbying efforts that are trying to fix that. Um, but it's one of the ways in which um, it's, it's a, it's a helpful part of the revenue stream that a farmer can get if they are able to achieve that CRSB standard. But really, it's going to be all the other things that come along through the uh, supply chain um, that actually finally contribute to a, uh, a, a economic project. Um, sustainable beef, as much as it deserves much more money, isn't getting the money it deserves just yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I wonder, Brent, I mean, when we talk about RNG, you know, we've, uh, we look at it as a, uh, you know, a, a product in and of itself. So, you know, we've, we're talking about these biogas projects and we have RNG and we're, we're looking to uh, put it into a pipeline and have it be uh, consumed uh, by, uh, you know, so, sort of in, in the distribution system, have it be consumed by you and I when we turn on our stoves. And, and I, but I wonder when we look at the agricultural communities and the resource communities where uh, on-farm RNG is being produced. I wonder if we also see RNG as a potential energy feedstock for industry and for resource, for resource industries, for agribusiness industries. So in other words, RNG, not as the, the end game, but rather a means to an end. And that end might be uh, a lower carbon intensity production. And maybe that's agribusiness production. Maybe that's natural gas production, you name it. I wonder if we're seeing that starting to emerge a bit. That, that's coming. That's coming and that absolutely is the end game. So, the, so I mean, you know, as far as methane going through these pipes, I don't think we're necessarily gonna be seeing as much of that around 2060. Um, it's supposed to be hydrogen by then. So we're actually going to be, uh, you know, we're actually gonna be, going be able to use the, this uh, methane as a feedstock for producing hydrogen and sequester the CO2 or utilize it. Um, so that's the, that's the end game. Um, same thing too, when it comes down to fertilizers as well, it'd be great to use this methane as a feedstock for various different fertilizers as well. But um, I mean, it, the, uh, the, there's that immediate need, that plug and play technology of, hey, it's the same molecule, it's CH4, just so happens it came from renewable sources, let's put it in, in, into the natural gas pipes. Great, no problem at all. And we need that. It's an absolute central necessary part of moving forward. Um, but the end game, once those pipes can handle it, as far as being able to handle H2 instead of CH4, um, it's gonna be a hydrogen economy. Um, but this is, a, this is an absolutely necessary step along that pathway where um, that CH4 we're making right now, it's immediately usable and immediately desirable and it is a renewable product but we eventually want to be burning things that have um, H2O as the yeah. uh, waste product yeah. as opposed to CO and H2O, CO2 yeah. and H2O. I, I, Brittany, I'm wondering if I can give you the last word on that. So, I mean, are we seeing, uh, and we've, you know, we've sort of talked about this uh, informally uh, for some time that, you know, RNG sort of being the, the transition fuel and hydrogen being the sort of end game as, as, as Brent describes, or at least the, 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 the final stop in this transition. I'm wondering, does Wood have a view on this? Uh, you know, where RNG fits in and how, how that transition to hydrogen, perhaps among other things, but hydrogen ultimately will take place? Um, yeah, I kind of spoke on this a little bit earlier as well, being able to produce a methane hydrogen mix um, to inject into the, into the natural gas network. Um, that's a really great short term. As Brent said, you know, hydrogen really is, is the future. Um, before, Brent, you also mentioned this too, on, you know, capturing that CO2 and sequestering it, you know, the benefit there really offers that, that carbon negative um, credits that you could get. So we are seeing a lot of a lot of interest in that space, but definitely the focus has been on hydrogen and how to produce uh, clean hydrogen. Um, 
steam methane reforming, autothermal reforming. That's kind of the main source of hydrogen production right now. So taking that methane. So taking that, you know, you could produce from animal waste this methane and process it through a hydrogen production facility to, to get your, your hydrogen um, capturing that, that carbon, there's your negative carbon solution. So getting kind of a green hydrogen production without the use of electrolysis. Um, yeah. yeah, with a, with a waste uh, feedstock, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Great. Well, I think I think uh, that is our time. Um, as you'll appreciate, uh, we could go on for much longer. Um, and each of these topics, probably each of these discussions, probably uh, could be a topic and a session in and of themselves. But uh, it was great to have all three of you. Thank you very much uh, for your insightful comments, your uh, your industry perspectives, and really the enthusiasm that I think we all feel. Uh, for this space, as we as we've described, the, the demand uh, miraculously is ahead of the supply, and so we're really catching up and figuring out how all this is going to work. It's the wild west, uh, literally and figuratively, uh, out here in uh, North America, and we're really excited about where this is headed. So I think uh, Swetha, we're going to pass it back to you and thank Be Wastewise for hosting us in our session today. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you to all the speakers for taking the time out today, especially you, Brent, it was really early for you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you to the audience. This is just information for the audience. There will be a recording of this webinar that will go up on the DeWastewise YouTube channel as well as on the website. I know a few of you have questions, so you could connect with the panelists separately. I, I'm sure you can find all of them on LinkedIn. And uh, in case you ha still have difficulty, please drop us an email at connect at wastewise.de and we will connect you with the speakers. Uh, a reminder for the audience, we have another webinar happening on Wednesday. So please go ahead and register for it. And that's it. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Cheers, cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.